we're in Psalm 27 this week, but let's take a, a journey back in our minds to a simpler time three weeks ago <laughs> uh, when we studied chapter 26 of the book of Psalms. And let us see what we remember. Well, Larry. David was the writer, and he begins the psalm saying that he's ready to be tried of the Lord, and he felt like he was righteous. Okay. Anybody else? He said he examined me and that he had been appointed to make sure that he was right. Mm hmm. That's right. Yeah, it was it, it. It was a. David was in a bad position as far as when people think this was written, and and on that topic, when do people think that this psalm was penned? Somebody other than Brother Larry and other people that have answered questions already. Yeah. Good to see that mom's following along very closely. <laughs> uh, we'll cut you some slack because it's Mother's Day. <laughs> Does anybody have any idea other than Brother Larry? I, I will come back to you if nobody raises their hand, Brother Larry, but when it might have been pinned. I know, I know. Somebody? What? S Sarah? You're, you're grinning pretty big for someone who doesn't have an answer. Well, they, you, the worst thing you can't you, you, the worst thing is they'll say you're wrong and then I'll move on to somebody else. That's right, yeah. Not as wrong as you thought you were. In fact, you're the opposite of wrong. Um, yes, this was being pinned during Absalom's time. So David was at this point where he was wondering. I need to make sure that I'm all lined up before I start shifting blame for what's going on to other folks. Uh, I need to uh, make sure that I'm all lined up before I start asking for help because David had some other experiences in his life that the root cause of a problem with not only with himself or with his family or with national Israel was directly David's fault. So he wanted to make sure that, that that was not the case. Anybody else? When Brother Andrew was saying that uh, he says, I will wash my hands in innocence, so like an Absalom offer, oh Lord. So he's, he's asking, he said, I'll wash my hands, you show me if I'm wrong. Yeah, we, we, made a, we made a reference to a very specific tabernacle implement. Does anybody remember that? Brother Larry, we'll come back to you. You've raised your hand three times, and you know what they say about you, you know you, you, you know what they say you know what they say about uh, it being the charm. So go ahead. The the basin of the tabernacle, which remember, I think all those implements migrated over to the to the temple anyway. But at this at this time, there was only a tabernacle, um, and the wash basin to Brother Junior's point that he brought up from verse 6, uh, the wash basin was forged from brazen mirrors that they brought from Egypt. The typification there, of course, being that it is a place where you cleanse yourself and where you see yourself as you really are. Um, and when we studied the tabernacle, we talked that about being a, a very good type of uh, both Christ and the Word. Where it is, it is some, something that both washes and reveals to you in stark detail of who you are. And he, um, verse 6 may, have, may be a reference that when he says, I will wash my hands in innocency, I, uh, so will I can pass thine altar. See, because before you could go into the tabernacle to the brazen altar, really the only altar that had public access to it, what did you have to do? You went to the door and you washed your hands. And then you made your way to the brazen altar with whatever sacrifice. For more on sacrifices, check our YouTube channel for our 13-part series on sacrifices. Um, 
Anybody else? I think we gleaned most of. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, being innocent of something uh, is is not guiltlessness. We did bring that out because I, and our our law in this country works the same way. If you break a law, even if you didn't know what the law was, you're still guilty of the law. Now, a judge or somebody that you know that is in a you know if let's say you're driving down the highway going along and the last posted speed limit sign that you saw was 55 miles an hour. And you're cranking along at 55 mile an hour. All of a sudden, you know, three, four, five miles pass. All of a sudden, you see blue lights in your back. You pull over to the side of the road. The 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 cop pulls up beside you. He said, "Do you know how fast you're going?" He said, "Well, I was going 55 miles an hour, which was the posted speed limit that I saw." He says, "No, this road actually goes from 55 to 45." And he said, "Well, I didn't see that." And he said, "Well," and then the officer might say, "Well, of course you didn't see that because the sign is down." So even though you're guilty of breaking the law, you have exceeded the posted speed limit because you did not you were not aware of the posted speed limit. I'm going to have leniency on you. Now, that's not necessarily how it is in God's law though. Being innocent of God's law does not make you any less guilty. If you're a sinner, you are guilty of all of it. Being guilty of something as innocent as saying um, you know, uh, I, I didn't, you know, I, well, it's like Gracie drew the big three on the wall and said that her brother did it. Uh, a, a humorous yet white, little white lie is what we would call that, um, makes her guilty of, of the same level of punishment that murderers are guilty of by God's standards. God, and, and innocency does not does not take that away, which is another reason why, why David w visited the spiritual wash basin to check, because he wanted to make sure that, you know, you can be innocent of a crime, but we have police officers, we have, we have law books. If you, a lawyer, that's basically what they do, is they know how to search for law and, and, and understand it and, and, and use it to the advantage or disadvantage of a client. And David wants to say, I may be innocent of something. I, I, I may have done something in innocency not knowing about it, but I want to know about it because I want to make it right so that we can take care of this problem. And that's kind of what the largest portion of, um, of, of chapter 20, uh, 26 is about. Um, good review. We'll put the pop quiz off for another time. You, you have gained mercy. Uh, but that's what we're here for. We're here to study. We're here to learn. And if, and, if, and, if we're not, and if we're not learning, then we might as well just pack it up and try something else, you know? Um, right, right. <laughs> uh, Psalms 27, though, is where it brings us. And we're actually still in this same timeline. We're still talking about... David's flight from Absalom. This chapter is really divided into two pieces. There is the first six verses, and then there's the last um, eight that make up this chapter. Um, we'll start with uh, the very first verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that, I, that, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. The first four verses are of confidence and jubilation at the, at the power and the awe of the Lord. Uh, Brother Jarrett 
taught in his, uh, in his lesson this morning about the, the immensity and the vastness and the greatness of our God. And the David acknowledges this in everything. He says, He is my light. He is my salvation. He is the strength of light. Uh, of life of my life um it, and he goes on to enumerate how th- that when foes come against him the lord causes stumbling blocks and 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 traps to fall upon upon their path um uh, uh, though a host should encamp against me my heart shall not fear the war should rise against me in this will i be confident david places full trust and confidence in the lord now this is not something that will hold all the way through to the final verse of this psalm. But David comes out with complete admiration and confidence in the Lord in these early verses. And then he goes on in verse 4 and makes a request. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, David was not did not have access to the tabernacle during his flight from Absalom. Remember, he moved the tabernacle closer to Jerusalem. Uh, I actually think it was outside of Jerusalem. I don't think they put it inside the city. Jarrett can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, but um, they uh, he had no access to it at the time because Absalom was ruling from Jerusalem at the time. So he had no access to the temple. And he says, Of all these things that I'm confident in, one thing do I desire above all, and that is to go to the house of the Lord. We've talked a lot about David's enemies and everything, and and we'll get into more on this later, but I, I don't really think we need to rehash that again because the last chapter holds a lot of that same context, that information. Not that these verses aren't valuable, but... Let's not rehash what we've what ground that we've already covered too 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 many times, but this request that he makes is important because it is it is something that you know you you, you look through the scripture and you look through the Bible and we don't find especially a lot in the New Testament about coming to the house of God the importance of coming to the house of God. A lot of people want to throw out the verse that forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, um, which is fine if you read that entire chapter does not really hold weight contextually with that chapter. There's a lot of other stuff going on in that chapter that when you arrive at that verse, it does not hold the same meaning that you think it means out of context. So when you're trying to make an argument for, yes, you need to be in church on Sunday morning, that's not a solid verse to to plant both your feet on because you're probably, if they have any knowledge of the Scripture whatsoever, fixing to have that rug pulled out from underneath you. My first thing that I always like to go to is the example of our dear Lord because we're supposed to be like Him. If if you claim to be a Christian, you're claiming to be Christ-like. That's what Christian means. And... The Lord said that it was his tradition and it was, it, was his, it was his manner to visit the temple every Sabbath day. Our Lord believed in going to the house of God as often as he could. But this verse brings, brings us even closer to this. He says, One thing have I desire of the Lord and that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What is the purpose of the four walls that we that we sit in? What is the point of them? Because if you read the scripture, especially in the New Testament, the church are the people. We we the the the, the four walls seemingly in the New Testament are stripped out. They hold a whole lot more value in the Old Testament. And you can say, well, this is an Old Testament verse, so you've, you, you've ruined your entire argument. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's e- it either, because multiple times in the Scripture, you can look at the day of Pentecost, you can look at the dedication of the temple, you can look at the dedication of the tabernacle, and multiple times in Scripture, when God's people meet in a place they have set aside for the worship of God, 
God makes a move. Is there anything intrinsically valuable about the wood and the steel and the, the, the fiberglass and nails and screws and a whole lot of blood and mistakes that this building is comprised of? No. There's nothing significant about the material itself. It is the dedication to which it was created. It is important to be at the house of God. Because God moves with His people at His house. Look at Isaiah's revelation in was it Isaiah chapter 6. Where was he at? He saw the train fill where? The temple. I was saved in a church. That doesn't mean that's the only place that you can be saved in, but this is where God meets with his people. And you say, oh, I can meet with God anywhere. You are absolutely correct. Enoch walked with God. And you guess, guess where he walked with him? Not in a church because there were no temples, there were no tabernacles, and there were no church houses in Enoch's time. Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. Yes, you can meet with God outside, but this is where God, where we have set aside to corporately worship our Lord together, and it is important to be here. More than that, David, he is praying to God right here. This psalm is a prayer. Was he unable to meet with the Lord because he couldn't get to the temple? No, but David knew that that is where God's presence was seated. That, is, that was the focal point of his worship. When people went into the tabernacle, they got a hold of the Lord. And David says that he will seek after this and that, that he would be in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. It's impossible for us to meet 24 hours a day, 7 days a week in here. We'd all starve to death. It would take a while, but we would all starve to death eventually. But I believe the spirit of this prayer is every time that I'm able to be there, I want to be there. Every time that, I, that, that uh, we can corporately meet with, with God's people, I want to be there. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. How many church services have you been in? And, and they're not every single one. You know what? Every time David showed up to the tabernacle, you know, the pillar of fire wasn't sitting down on the temple there. Every time Isaiah was in the temple, he didn't see the Lord's train fill it. But oh, the times when we can catch a glimpse of our Lord as he passes by, as he, as he shows himself to us. There have been times here. I, there have been times in the old building. I was very, very young, but I remember pl- times like that at Bumpus Mills too. All through the scripture you can see this. Pentecost. Actual cloven tongues of fire came down. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And you know what? That does not happen. I don't, I don't really see a lot of it outside of the house of the Lord. This is one of the one of the, one of the places where where as a corporate people when we're worshiping together you get unique experiences. It doesn't mean that you'll never see God. That doesn't mean you'll never commune with God outside of His church. You can you can you can pray and be with God as often as you want outside of the church, and I recommend that you do. But you're gonna get, you're gonna gonna get gain unique experiences here. And what else? What why else did he want to be at the house of God to inquire in His temple. This is where we come to ask God why. This is where we come to learn. What's the whole point of this afternoon thing? It started out mostly to burn time because we were waiting to uh, eat or we were waiting to have the evening service, but it ultimately became the time where we sit down together outside of the constraints of a normal service where we can all talk together and learn together and ask questions together to inquire of the scriptures the stuff that we need to know and we've had some we've had some revelations haven't we not i've had some revelations i know i have 
For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Now David is calling back on a, on a time in his life where he also was running from somebody. Does anybody remember what this time was? We've studied the life of David like three times. So uh, let's, let's, let's try Brother Junior here. Well, he was running from Absalom here, but another time in his life when he was running from someone else. Saul, that's right. After he left his wife, Saul's daughter, where was the first place that he ran? He didn't run to his boys. He didn't run to his soldiers. Where did he run? He ran... Well, he, we went to Jonathan, but, but he ran to the tabernacle. He got two things from the tabernacle. He got the shoe bread, and he got Goliath's sword. He ran to the house of God. When we're in trouble, our hiding place, our fortress, is this place. And, and does it have to necessarily be this place? Again, I, I'm not trying to create significance in a building where there is none. But if we've corporately decided that Brother Larry's shed down from his house is now the place where we're going to meet with God, that is now our fortress. That is the, pl- that is the place where that when we need to pour ourselves out before God and God's people and we need comfort and strength and caring, that's where we do it. David said, that he would that he was being uh, uh, that he was being hid in the pavilion and set up on a rock. Not only not only is he hidden and and, and there's almost this uh, this uh, uh, mother hen type uh, um, idea in this verse, kind of being sheltered, but also sheltered with a firm foundation, a place to land. Because when you're out there, the world shifts so much. It changes so much. And if you don't have a solid place to put your feet on, you you can very, very quickly lose your way. Get swept up in all the the craziness that's about us. Um, now, uh, Now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore, while I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy, I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Again, he says... He's going to come into the house and he will offer his sacrifices of joy and sing. This this is a place of praise. This is a place of worship. We don't come in here to, you know, I don't know, tithe our time out to the Lord. You know, you know, this 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 isn't the place where I've got to give the Lord something this week. I guess I'll go down the, the down to the church. Um no, this this is this is the place where after everything he's done for you for the week, you rest and you thank him for allowing you to make one more revolution <laughs> around the sun and and thank him for all the things that he's done here. And David says, "When I finally get in there, I'm not going to offer turtle doves. I'm not going to offer blood. I'm not going to offer a drink offering. I'm not going to offer a meat offering, uh, tons of other offerings. Ask Brother Jarrett. (laughs) I'm going to go in there. I'm going to drop to my knees, and I'm going to praise God for protecting me, for being with me, for helping me. And then the term, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and to answer me. When when thou saidest, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in uh, away in anger, thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Now it almost seems like a turn here, but really I think he's what we're looking at here is Someone being homesick. Someone wanting to be back in God's place. Wanting to be back where the Lord, the Lord meets with His people. He says, he says I'm going to sing praise to the Lord. And he says, O Lord, hear my voice. Uh, uh, o Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me and answer me. His prayers from His prayer from chapter 26 
it's still holding here. Because at the end of chapter 26, if you read verse 12, chapter 26 says, My foot standeth even in, a, in place, in the, co in the congregations will I bless my Lord. Basically, end of verse 12, is a, tw chapter 26 is a long prayer, and 12 is saying, I'm going to wait for you to answer. And then he opens up with all this praise and confidence in here, and then he starts talking about the tabernacle and what he wants to do whenever he gets it back. And then I think in verse 7, it's almost an outpouring. It's like, please... Let me come home. A desire to be in the house of the Lord that goes beyond, I think, what we see from anybody anymore. Drag me down to the house of God should be, should be our motto. Are there extenuating circumstances that keep us out of the house of God? Yes, I think David is in one of them right here. When, when, when your son is chasing you down with swords and spears and arrows... Probably not going to be able to make it to the house of God that week. But the desire should still be there. And if when you're not at church, you're more comfortable, that's a problem. A sincere problem. And, and, not, and not one of those, you know, like, uh, it, it could be, not one of those that, you, you, you know, you might be lost problems. It may just be that you're just so far away, you don't know where home is anymore. I've been lost in the woods a couple of times, especially when I was a kid. I remember being lost. I remember not know, knowing where to find Sarah was with me on some of those occasions. She remembers being lost in the woods. And never was I comfortable with being lost in the woods. Never, being, never was I ever happy about not knowing where the house was at. But somehow, people, Christians, find the ability just, well, I guess we're lost in the woods. Let's just set up a house here. I guess this is where we're living now. This is where we're staying. With never a thought of the comforts of home ever again. And David, I think, is here. He, 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 asks, uh, he says, uh, he said, when thou saidest, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face will I seek. He says, I've done the work. Moreover, he said, I'm, I'm still looking, and please don't hide your face from me. That's what verse 9 is. Don't, don't pull it further back. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. He says, when my father and my mother forsake me. Uh, you know, we're, this is Mother's Day. If, if for those that are watching in the future, hello, future people. Um, the um, it, this is this is Mother's Day, twenty twenty one, and Mother's Day is a recognition, basically, of all the, the the care and sorrow and sweat and tears and blood and pain and everything else that goes into being a mother and providing the comforts that we identify with motherhood. You never, feel, you never feel more safe or at ease than in your mother's arms. And David recognizes, though, those are going to run out. Eventually, that's going to end, whether by time, by illness, or in this case, says, when my father and my mother forsake me. That's not death. That's not. That is a turning away. <laughs> that is, I'm not. You're not a son anymore. Where does David's confidence reside? He says, I, I, I think we can go all the way back up to uh, to verse five. If he shall set me up on a rock, where does he land when he falls out of the good graces of his father and his mother? Then the Lord will take me up. Never better friend. I, I think that there's a reason that the New Testament and the Old Testament often refers to, to Jesus and Jehovah as father and brother and, 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 and in familial terms. Why? Be, be, because he's a family member that will, that it will never forsake you. He said, well, I, I, the Lord's forsaken me a plenty of times. No, no, that's not that. You forsook him, <laughs> but he did not forsake you. He is always there for a landing. He is always there for counsel and comfort. That's 
literally some of the names that are used for him in the Bible. <laughs> um, deliver me not, uh, 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 verse 11, uh, uh, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. David is asking here for something that I don't think he's asked here in two in this situation. He said a plain path. He's not saying a broad path. He's not saying an easier path. He's saying, I need something that is big runway lights and that I know where to go. I'm, 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 I'm tired of looking for the needle in the haystack. Uh, I need you to show me you know, a big, big beacon. This is where you need to be, David. A plain path, an easy-to-find path. It doesn't have to be easy to walk. I just need to know where to go. Deliver me not unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, as, uh, um, and, a, and such as breathe out cruelty. Now, I think this is in direct reference to some of the stuff that's going on in, with Absalom, is this false witnessing, because that was one of the things that Absalom did. He literally stood in the gate and befamed David and, and run down his reign. Um, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's saying that if I would have passed out, I would have gone along to, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says there, there are better times on the horizon, not in the future. I, I feel like that's always what we do. Say, well, everything's terrible here, but one day everything will be better. And, and most of the time that's in reference to over yonder when we get to heaven. And you're absolutely right. Things will be better when we get over there. The, 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 the heaven itself is supposed to be an ultimate reward. But David is saying, I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to faint, if you will, because I look to better days here. I know that there are better days coming. We live, and I think I've said this many times before, we live such defeated lives right. when we worship and are, 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 are children of so great a God. Better days are coming. Here, there, or in the air, better days are coming. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, verse 14 ends, kind of echoes verse 12 from chapter 26. David comes to the end of this almost period of, of outpouring emotion as he's meditating upon the Lord with, again, I'm going to wait on you to move. Patience is, is something that I have yet to master. I probably will never fully uh, master it because God does things in His own time. When He says that He believed to see good, the, the goodness of the Lord in the land of uh, in the land of the living, uh, yeah, the goodness of the Lord is coming. Right. It just might not be day. Ask Job. Job spent a long time with nothing but a wife that wouldn't support him and boils all over his body right. before things got better. In fact, the majority of the book of Job is spent with him in that terrible condition. But better days are coming. Which is why I think he ends this with, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Are you courageous enough to wait? Any questions or comments on chapter 27 of the book of Psalms? All right, well, study up on it. We'll have, we'll have just a good review next week as we had this week, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, have a good week. Thank you.